Here's a confession. The thing I love the most about multiplayer games is not the gameplay, the competitiveness, or the social interactions. It's a crowd. The crowd I find myself in when surrounded by other players, marching on towards the same goal or fighting each other in a chaotic fashion. There's nothing like completing a dungeon or a quest in an MMORPG and coming back to town where many other players are gathered around. There lies a bustling life, a never-ending commotion of players that pulls me in, ironically because none of these players are here for me. Everybody gathers there to wait, to find a party, to sell and buy items, to go about their business without really interacting with one another. People just wait there because other people do too. And it is there, among everyone else, among that vibrant multiplicity, that I find myself the most alone and happily so. But why is that the case? Why do we feel alone in the very place we shouldn't? To answer these questions, we need to look at Edgar Allan Poe and his 1840 short story, The Men of the Crowd. Poe's story starts off with the protagonist looking at a crowd from a coffee shop's window, absorbed by the sight of hundreds and hundreds of people walking next to each other and forming a human mass that's hardly distinguishable, except for a strange old man whose gaze and demeanor stand out. Curious about the old man, the protagonist dashes into the street and follows him in the hopes of deciphering his nature. But this is no easy task, because throughout the night and the following day, the old man only ever walks among crowds, constantly looking for busy streets to blend in with as many crowds as possible. The moment people disperse and are no longer packed together, the old man falters and appears in shambles, rushing to merge with the next group of people. For the protagonist, that man refuses to be alone. He is a man whose solitary existence can only thrive in the company of anonymous presences. Poe's account of a crowned man helps us define the exhilaration or discomfort one may feel when among many. The unique characteristic of crowds is that they give us the opportunity to find ourselves surrounded by a multiplicity so extreme that the faces and people around us become blurred, lost to the sheer magnitude of the crowd. Because of the high density of people in the same spot, individualities start to disappear which, in turn, may make us question our own identity. Who are we when among many? And how can a crowd be both the loneliest and the most populated place of all? This video essay aims to analyze the solitude that comes with playing multiplayer games, whether because we deliberately look for solitude when among others, or because it comes to us despite our attempts at avoiding it. The reason games can help us think about this is because their social and non-social aspects are exacerbated considering how they gather millions and millions of players every day. In other words, games bring in crowds that never truly vanish, and Poe's man of the crowd may well be an average player these days. So let's embark together on a solitary journey into the depth of virtual worlds, into our gaming habits therein, and what they may tell us about ourselves. I often find myself booting up a dungeon in Final Fantasy XIV or in World of Warcraft just for the pleasure of wandering with other players and healing them, contributing to a made-up team composed, most of the time, of random people I've never interacted with personally. But I keep wondering, who are these people I play with? What's this group of players I belong to for a fleeting moment before we all finish the dungeon and disband? There's something odd in the idea of playing or interacting with people in a virtual space just for a short time before parting ways. Multiplayer games offer opportunities to group up with people we don't know and we'll likely never see again. Let's consider Overwatch, for instance, a game that requires intense teamwork over rounds that last between 10 to 30 minutes. During that time, I'm doing my best to help and contribute to a team, I communicate and try to form a cohesive group that can function efficiently and win. So in many ways, I socialize, but I do so for someone or for something that won't last. 
Games confront us with momentary interactions that have no future, just like a crowd. And just like a crowd, we participate in a group, we contribute to its formation by adding our presence, but we also retain autonomy, because once the match is over and the lobby breaks up, we are back to being on our own without the constraints of following anyone. Final Fantasy XIV is a case example of this, being an MMORPG that can be entirely played solo, since the game is story-driven and its dungeons can be played with AI companions. Many players mourn the fact that MMORPGs are getting more and more solo-friendly these days, losing incentives to play together and forge communities, guilds, etc. This is definitely true and I get that. FF14 doesn't necessarily require players to work together or build friendships like in WoW Classic. Facilitating solo play in an MMORPG implies losing aspects of what's used to define MMORPGs, that is, the fact that players needed to organize themselves, to converse with one another, to form alliances, guilds, or just bonds. And yet, FF14 has one of the best games community out there, providing a sense of camaraderie in dungeons and raids, where people try to help each other out, to cheer and encourage one another. Interestingly, the game achieves a strong sense of community while catering to solo players. It invites loneliness within a strong community, it offers solitude while still providing solidarity, and as such, it is a fascinating example of a game that manages to pair up solitude with multitude, that leaves us with the possibility to be on our own while still enjoying the presence of others. The trend toward more solo-friendly MMORPGs shouldn't be perceived as a collapse of the genre, rather, it offers new possibilities to play and enjoy multiplayer games by complexifying what it means to play with other people. Another form of solidarity may be found in War Classic, as the game shows a vital side of MMORPGs. The necessity to acknowledge and interact with other players as they roam around the world, to cooperate with them, and to welcome their unexpected presence. The 19th century poet Charles Baudelaire, in a text on crowds, explains that the highest joy we may get from a crowd resides in giving ourselves to the unexpected as it comes along, in opening ourselves to the stranger as they pass by. The challenging world of War Classic requires players to form transitory alliances just to kill a strong mob. It also requires players to organize small groups in order to clear a dungeon, to prepare team fights in the open world PvP, etc which all strongly benefit from the lack of fast travel. What interests me here, in this, is not the end game rate content that pushes players to be in a guild or to go to absurd length to stay competitive. What I love about War Classic is the sporadic encounters within the world, while playing alone, because they mean something and require ephemeral cooperations. In vastly different ways, both FF14 and WoW Classic offer the possibility to play alone among many, to interact and be social for a brief time and without the hassle of social obligations. But for that to happen, MMORPGs need to feel massive despite their current focus on solo play. Both can coexist as massive crowds of players send us back to the fact that we are mere drops in a notion of others, that our individuality is overshadowed by the plurality surrounding us. It feels exhilarating to be able to walk among virtual crowds and retain a sense of individuality because it requires us to embrace our loneliness when within a virtual space defined by its plurality. This feeling also participates in making the world we play in much bigger because it implies that we inhabit that world, that we populate that world instead of having it being there just for us. And it is in that moment, that is, in the moment a world lives on without us, that we truly feel like living in that world. In good MMORPGs, everything should continue evolving outside of our actions and our role in the world, because when that's the case, fraternity rises from the fact that everybody's greatness comes from teaming up with others. In a virtual crowd, everybody's alone with each other, which holds especially true in an age where couch gaming slowly disappears to the benefit of online play. My intention here is not to mourn couch co-op by highlighting the solitude of playing online, 
Rather, I want to show how complex and interesting playing online can feel like in our current time. Because it is a place in which I can be no one and yet like everyone. It is a place where my individuality is dependent on others. And most importantly, it is a place in which I can populate my solitude. Now, what about games that run themselves as multiplayer but offer a unique solo experience? Playing The Division feels drastically different when played solo and I roam around New York on my own to feel the desolation left behind the virus breakout. My solitude matches the desolation of the city and there's something both eerie and magical in rediscovering an urban world left abandoned. If I were to play with others, New York or Washington in the case of The Division 2 would feel more like playgrounds in which fights take place and loot is abundant. There's nothing wrong with that, but I love how different cities feel when I walk in them alone. No longer just playgrounds, but now daunting entities in which I proceed with caution and it coincides with the state of New York and Washington in the games. Once again, everything appears bigger, more daunting, more impenetrable when we are left to our own devices. On that note, Deep Rock Galactic is another game whose multiplayer system shines bright. But once we strip it down of its co-op system and go do missions with no other dwarves but ourselves, we get an incredible atmospheric game that now feels spookier than it ever did before and you should watch SNES videos on the unique atmosphere of the game. The whole experience of excavating my way through an asteroid's dark caves takes on another meaning when I feel isolated and can only count on myself and Bosco to get out of there. The same can be said about Sea of Thieves, a game that puts players at a massive disadvantage when they're going solo. Not only is the game much slower and grindier when sailing the seas alone, it also makes every encounter with other players at sea almost insurmountable because being outnumbered is very difficult to overcome. But it is also precisely why I love the game so much. There's more at stake when I'm on my own and the sea feels like a dangerous place with no respite. One of my most memorable moments in this game is when I was being chased down by a group of players for about an hour before I managed to outmaneuver them with my small boat. Doing this felt like I was playing against the rules, like I was finding a way to cheat the game and disrupt the normal way of playing it. In this light, playing solo can provide more than an added sense of adventure and danger, as it also symbolizes a new approach to a game we love a new interpretation of its rules and systems. Playing solo is a stance against a game's multiplayer laws, a pirating of its norms, an act of reappropriation for oneself. Asymmetrical multiplayer systems also need to be discussed here, as they provide yet another take on the solitude multitude effect. Games that are primarily meant for solo play may find ways to connect players together without really being multiplayer. The Soulsborne series popularized this trend, with its messages left on the ground by other players, or the blood stains and summon systems that call other players for a brief moment into our game before they disappear. While I discussed this topic in my video on Elden Ring and the Uncanny, it's important to note how brilliant the system is at evoking the presence of others in a world in which we play and feel alone. The Neo series offers a great take on that system by changing the Soulsborne bloodstains into potential enemies we can invoke to fight or partner with. And many other games follow the trend. Nier Automata lets you summon the corpses of other players, Returnal lets you fight the monsters that killed them, and Death Stranding lets you use other players' constructions. It is no coincidence that these examples come from games whose worlds are devastated and uncanny. The sense of isolation participates in making distanced, far out interactions with other players more meaningful, because the echoes of others, their partial presence, both increase and decrease our loneliness. What's more is that these systems got popular in the last decade or so, when playing online became the norm, and it can be explained in that the asymmetry of the Soulsborne series somehow mirrors the way we play games nowadays and the new types of interactions we find online. Philosophers used to distinguish solitude from loneliness, 
the former being the capacity to feel content when alone with oneself, the latter being the inability to feel connected when surrounded by others. But I think online play, as it stands today, complicates the divide. It's fascinating to see solidarity emerge from systems through which we never truly interact with others and yet feel surrounded and drawn to them. All together, like brothers in arms, in a world, virtual or not, that leaves us vulnerable and secluded. That common ground, that shared seclusion, is a condition through which fraternity appears among people who do not know each other. From this, we may infer that solitude itself may very well have changed, that playing solo is no longer a prejudicial act done to oneself, but something more, something akin to a newfound solidarity with those who, just like us, just like you and me, live in a postmodern society. Looking back at Poe's story, we come across something odd when searching for the real identity of the man of the crowd. Is that person the old man the protagonist follows in the busy streets so to observe him some more? Or is it the protagonist himself who, just like the old man he follows, ends up spending hours upon hours in crowds? The story ends with the search being inconclusive and the protagonist declaring that he shall learn no more from the old man because the latter doesn't permit himself to be read. That expression, it does not permit itself to be read, not only starts and ends Poe's story, it also indicates the impossibility of finding a definitive answer to the question of the protagonist and of the reader who tries to elucidate the text. And it's an expression that embodies the elusive characteristics of modern and postmodern solitudes. From Poe to our current time, solitude may have been both everywhere and nowhere, constant and rare all at once. The 17th century French philosopher Jean de la Bruyère thought that all our unhappiness comes from our inability to be alone. But a lot has changed since then regarding solitude, as the existence of a man of the crowd or a solo player in multiplayer games complicate this statement, in that they're both alone and not alone. For Baudelaire, we can embrace a crowd by having the ability to switch between being oneself and being someone else, by staying withdrawn from the multitude while welcoming the identities of others passing by. And isn't that what we're trying to achieve when subverting a multiplayer game to fit our desire to play solo? Neither alone nor in group, solo play in a multiplayer environment is nothing else but play. Play of the rules, of the system, of the limits of a game and what constitutes solitude. Playing is the answer to an inherent human condition we cannot escape, but that we can fiddle with in order to acknowledge it. Playing, then, is not coping out or running away, for it may lead to the recognition and acceptation of the solitude that never leaves us and that does not permit itself to be read. And so here we are playing with our never-ending solitude and with the fact that we can never truly be alone. Here we are, embracing the solitude multitude paradox so to shake up our lives in an ultra-connected world that leaves many on their own. If loneliness reaches everyone, and if, at the same time, there is no escape from anyone, then why not playing? Why not prouding ourselves from having never felt so alone than when playing together?